Hi, my name is Annabelle Raw. I'm a health rights lawyer at the Southern Africa Litigation Center. I will be talking about the right to health and the prohibition on torture, inhuman and degrading treatments for persons with disabilities. Broadly, I will be speaking under three topics in this presentation. In the first section, we'll look at the right to health as a concept, how it's developed under international human rights law, the idea of health being an inclusive right, and the state's obligations that fall under a right to health. In the second section, we'll look at the right to health for persons with disabilities in particular. We'll look at how that right is framed under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, and how health rights are violated for persons with disabilities. In the third section, We'll look at the prohibition on torture, inhuman and degrading treatment, and how this relates to the right to health. In particular, we'll look at the issues of informed consent, forced and coercive sterilization, the use of restraints in healthcare, involuntary admission to healthcare facilities, and the denial of healthcare treatment. What does the concept of a right to health mean? Outside of its legal meanings, when I think about the right to health, three things come to mind. The first is the idea of human dignity. The idea that the right to health is very closely linked to the notion of a life with dignity. The second is the notion of equality. How intimately linked the enjoyment of the right to health is with equality and its denial in discrimination. And the third is the idea of a right itself. Health is so often perceived as a good fortune, as a gift, a financial commodity, or even a moral achievement. But seldom do we conceive it as a human right, something that we can demand and to which we can claim an entitlement. In these ideas, I find beautifully expressed in the words of Kofi Annan when he said, it is my aspiration that health finally will be seen not as a blessing to be wished for, but as a human right to be fought for. And in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. The legal origins of an internationally recognized human right to health can be seen from the 1940s. The 1945 United Nations Charter includes in Articles 55 and 56, when we read them together, a pledge to take action on health. The idea that health is a right is in 1946 stated with a sense of easy consensus in the Constitution of the World Health Organization, or the WHO. From this early origin, the notion that the right to health includes both physical and mental health is quite clearly framed. In addition, the importance of non-discrimination is noted, as well as the founding of its enjoyment being in a social context. In 1948, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights included the right to health under Article 25 as part of the right to an adequate standard of living. Article 25 notes, in addition, the link to the right to security in the event of disability. In 1966, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, or ICESCR, was adopted. This included, in Article 12, the rights of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. In 1981, CEDAW, or the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, came into effect. This included particular articulation of the right to health for women, and in 1986, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights came into effect, which stated that every individual shall have the right to enjoy 
the best attainable standard of physical and mental health. Coming into effect in 1990, the CRC, or Convention on the Rights of the Child, included a right to health for children under Article 24. In addition, it specifies special measures with respect to health rights for children with disabilities in Article 23. Towards the 2000s, the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child and the Maputo Protocol on the Rights of Women in Africa both included rights to health. Finally, in 2008, the CRPD has particularized the right to health in the context of persons with disabilities. Article 25 of the CRPD will be discussed a little while later. One way to conceptualize the right to health is to understand it as an inclusive right. It includes entitlements, standards of goods and services, freedoms, and the underlying determinants of health. Entitlements under the right to health include the right to have access to health care and to equality and non-discrimination. Entitlements include access to essential medicines, to sexual and reproductive health care, to health-related education and information, and to participation in health-related decision-making at community and national level. The right to health further requires that health-related goods and services must be made available and accessible in terms of both physical and financial accessibility. Goods and services must also be of a good quality and medically, scientifically, and culturally acceptable and appropriate. The right to health further encompasses certain freedoms. This includes freedom from coerced or forced treatment, including being coercively or forcibly sterilized, freedom from being subjected to non-consensual medical experimentation, and freedom from inhuman and degrading treatment and torture. Finally, the right to health is dependent on factors that enable one to live a healthy life. These are called the underlying determinants of health. This includes commodities like safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, adequate food and housing, and a healthy environment and working conditions. Typically, when people speak of socioeconomic rights, like the right to health, the refrain is that the right lacks context, that it is unenforceable because it lacks immediate obligations. This understanding is often explained in reference to the idea that the right to health is subject to progressive realization. But to state boldly, however, that the right to health entails only progressive obligations is in my mind not entirely accurate. I would argue that the misuse of the term progressive realization can therefore be a bit of a red herring in our understanding of the right to health. First, the ways in which state obligations in terms of human rights are framed are usually recited in reference to the three obligations to respect, protect and fulfill human rights. The meaning of these obligations are quite fully expanded in the context of the right to health and a general comment 14. Secondly, I think it's important to speak in very specific reference to the language of particular conventions and constitutions that actually frame the obligations quite differently. So, for example, in the ICESCR, in Article 2.1, state obligations are framed as being to take steps to the maximum of their available resources to achieve progressively the full realization of socio-economic and cultural rights. The content of state obligations therefore include an immediate obligation to take steps 
and to do this within the maximum available resources. It is only the end measure, the effect of these steps, that speak to progressive realization. However, the achievement of the enjoyment of the right is measured against state resources. But the failure to take steps and to progressively take steps can surely be measured and enforced. The Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has further explored that the obligation not to discriminate in respecting, protecting and fulfilling the right to health is an immediate obligation. The adoption of retrogressive measures would further be an infringement of the right that could not be excused in reference to the notion of progressive realization. Lastly, the committee has developed a concept called minimum core obligations, a notion of aspects of the right to health that are the bare minimum that all states must provide immediately. The committee has, for example, included in the minimum core on the right to health essential medicines in reference to the WHO list of essential medicines. The concept is controversial, however, as many argue it is vague, culturally and contextually differential, and subject to a lot of contestation. What is important, however, is to understand that the idea of progressive realization is not a blank check for states to indefinitely defer the realization of the right to health under the ICESCR. The language of the right to health under the African Charter is more generous than the ICESCR in my reading. Article 16.2 of the Charter requires that states take the necessary measures to protect the health of their people and to ensure that they receive medical treatment when they are sick. To assume the right under the Charter includes a progressive realization clawback is therefore unfaithful to the generous language of the Charter. Constitutional and embodiments of the right to health may also vary significantly. The South African Constitution of 1996 provides for the right to health in various embodiments, including the right to access emergency services, the right to basic health care for children, and the right to medical services for detained persons under sections 27, 28 and 35 respectively. The right to universal access to health care is framed in Article 20, pardon me, Section 27.1 that everyone has the right to access health care services, including reproductive health care. In Subsection B, the state is obliged to take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of the right. In the Constitutional Court of South Africa's decision in the Grootboom case, state obligations were framed in terms of the legal standard of reasonableness. The court has refused to adopt the ICESCR's minimum core approach and instead looks at the reasonableness of the measures that the state has taken or failed to take with respect to health in determining violations. Mm -hmm. Turning to part two of the presentation. Health under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It is worth noticing that health is an important part of the CRPD. The words health and healthy are mentioned 20 times in the Convention. Article 25 of the right, on the right to health emphasizes the obligation on states not to discriminate on grounds of disability in realizing the right to health. This includes the right to enjoy sexual and reproductive health care services and other services enjoyed by all members of the community, as well as health services that are specific to persons with disabilities. 
Importantly, Article 25C states that health services should be provided as close as possible to people's own communities and stresses the centrality of informed consent to healthcare on an equal basis with others. The importance of this will be discussed in more detail later. For persons with disabilities, the right to health is very closely linked to other important rights and concepts developed in the CRPD and with the disability rights movement more broadly. You can imagine that the enjoyment of the right to health for persons with disabilities is balancing very delicately on the foundation of other rights. Its enjoyment very much depends on freedom from discrimination and the enjoyment of equality with other persons including the equal enjoyment of the right to legal capacity and to the recognition of individual autonomy, physical and psychological integrity, and to human dignity. Participation and social inclusion are fundamental to the enjoyment of the right to health for persons with disabilities, as are the rights grounded in accessibility and reasonable accommodation. The right to health for children with disabilities requires the recognition of the evolving capacities of children. The right to sexual and reproductive health rights for persons with disabilities can't be enjoyed if the sexual rights and sexual autonomy of persons with disabilities aren't first recognized and respected. Persons with disabilities, both physical and mental, experience violations of their right to health in many ways, including the denial of access to healthcare, to social determinants of health, and when accessing healthcare services. Some reports have documented some of these violations. For example, the 2014 report by the Mental Disability Advocacy Centre, MDAC, and Munza, the Mental Health Users Network of Zambia, on human rights and mental health in Zambia, describes how mental health care services are, quote, virtually non-existent at primary health care level in Zambia. This, in essence, forces an effective denial of health care access for persons with mental health needs in rural and peri-urban areas, and for persons with the so without the socioeconomic resources to travel long distances to access these healthcare services. In this context, the nature of services provided at centralized psychiatric centers in Zambia occasions severe violations of the human and health rights of persons with mental disabilities. These include the prolonged and arbitrary detention of persons with mental disabilities, including in prisons, not only psychiatric institutions. These treatments are very tenuously called for treatment purposes, where these centers are rather used to detain and control persons with mental health needs, rather than to meaningfully treat and rehabilitate people. This abuse includes chaining people to beds, forced isolation, and forced sedation through the use of strong psychiatric drugs, interventions done typically without the informed consent or in the absence of advanced directives. The 2014 Human Rights Report in Zambia, We Are Also Dying of AIDS, documents in a different way how persons with disabilities in Zambia struggle to access HIV prevention and treatment services. It explains how adults, as well as children with disabilities, are sy systemically excluded from accessing HIV prevention information and services, linked to the failure to provide appropriate education, for example, for children with disabilities failures to reasonably accommodate for the very varied needs of persons with, for example, visual or hearing impairment, renders private and confidential pre- and post-test counselling inaccessible. Persons with disabilities are often denied confidentiality and full informed consent when accessing healthcare for HIV services in the result. A 2016 report from the Southern Africa Litigation Centre, or SALC, in Botswana and Zambia documented narratives of physical and verbal abuse experienced by persons with physical disabilities when accessing healthcare, and incidences of being denied sexual and reproductive healthcare services 
particularly for women with disabilities, who are presumed to be sexually inactive. The central theme of informed consent was similarly documented as in other reports, where persons with disabilities are seldom given appropriate information about the services and treatments being performed, and are frequently denied the autonomy to make their own decisions about their health care. These abuses and healthcare denials illustrate violations of the right to health, of the right to freedom from discrimination, to dignity, and to physical and psychological integrity. In some cases, these types of violations may also amount to an infringement of the right to freedom from torture and inhuman and degrading treatment. Moving on to the third section. In this section, we'll be discussing when is healthcare torture. In essence, we'll be exploring the relationship between the prohibition on torture, on cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, and the right to health. I will be referring quite extensively here to the reports of the Special Rapporteur on Torture and Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, Juan Mendez. I've drawn the link there on the slide to take you to that report, because I think it quite comprehensively sets out the relationship between these two rights and, and how the right to the, the prohibition on torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment is violated in the context of healthcare. I won't belabor the, the distinction, the conceptual distinctions between torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, but to highlight a few points here to ground our discussion on what this looks like in the context of healthcare. So you will recall that under Article 1.2 of the Convention Against Torture, or CAT, there are four constituent elements of torture. Firstly, in order to amount to torture, there needs to be an act that inflicts severe pain or suffering. That pain or suffering may be physical or mental. Secondly, to amount to torture, that act needs to be committed with the element of intent. Thirdly, that act needs to be done with a specific purpose in mind. And it needs to have the involvement of a state official, or at least the acquiescence of the state or a state official. Acts that fall short of this definition, that perhaps lack a purpose element, may nevertheless constitute cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment if they fall under Article 16 of CAT. In the report that I've referred you to, the Special Rapporteur then explores some of these constituent elements of the definition of torture. A legal mind might start wondering whether we can imply intent or a specific purpose when a healthcare provider is actually just providing what they think is, is necessary medical treatment. Can we still nevertheless say that there's an intent to torture? Um, and, and this is really where the Special Rapporteur gives us some very well-grounded examples and explanations that helps us navigate these concepts. Firstly, he speaks about intent. Particularly, he says that intent can be effectively implied where a person has been discriminated against on the basis of their disability. And he says this is even if what is being offered is treatment and it is well intended. So this is to say that if a healthcare provider provides a medical intervention like electroshock therapy, that is known in the medical profession to be treatment and that he intends this to be um, treating the person, he intends it to make them better. If it's nevertheless um, discriminatory in, in the basis that it is applied only to persons with disabilities, um, we may nevertheless there infer the element of intent from that conduct. If the conduct is purely negligent, so we have no intent that we can infer under Article 1 of the Convention, it may not be torture, but the act may nevertheless constitute ill-treatment if it leads to severe pain and suffering. 
The special rapporteur further explores the purpose element. He looks at how the purpose element uh, is, is explained in a non-exhaustive list, but the elements that are included are aspects of punishment, intimidation, coercion, and again, a possible element of discrimination. He says that the explicit or implicit aim of inflicting punishment or the objective of intimidation often exists alongside ostensibly therapeutic aims. And so in this way, a healthcare provider may have clearly therapeutic aims in providing a particular therapy or healthcare intervention. However, this does not rule out that there may exist alongside those therapeutic aims um, in, in explicit or implicit intents of punishment or intimidation or discrimination. With regard to gender-sensitive definitions of torture, the Special Rapporteur has explained that the purpose element is always fulfilled when it comes to gender-specific violations against women, in that such violence is inherently discriminatory. I think we could look at disability in an analogous way, that when we were talking about disability-specific violence against persons with disabilities, um, that violence is inherently discriminatory. Um, and so we can say that it there meets the purpose element under the Torture Convention. The Special Rapporteur also refers to the decision of the European Court of Human Rights, where it is noted that a violation of Article 3 of that con the Convention on Human Rights may occur where the purpose or intention of the state's action or inaction was not necessarily to degrade, humiliate or punish the victim, but where this was nevertheless the result of that conduct. So in sum, the Special Rapporteur says that medical care that causes severe pain for no justifiable reason can be considered cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And if that medical care causes unnecessary pain or suffering, and if there is state involvement and specific intent, that conduct is torture. He specifies that treatment that is provided in violation of the terms of the CRPD cannot be legitimate or justified under the medic medical necessity doctrine. He emphasizes that there is a heightened state obligation to prevent torture for vulnerable and marginalized persons, which may include persons with disabilities. So under this framework of how we understand the relationship between torture and the right to health to function, we can start looking at some specific violations against persons with disabilities. Firstly, we will talk a little bit about informed consent. Informed consent is packaged in many different ways under different jurisdictions. I will refer to the jurisdictions that I understand. Um, but broadly, we know that informed consent is conceptualized as requiring three constituent elements. Firstly, it requires knowledge. Secondly, appreciation. And thirdly, consent or some form of agreement. So in the context of a medical procedure, the knowledge that is required extends to the risks of that procedure, its consequences, as well as available alternatives. So whether it is the extraction of a tooth, whether it is an HIV test or sterilization, the patient needs to know what the risks are, the consequences and what available alternatives are. Secondly, they actually need to appreciate those risks, consequences and available alternatives. And thirdly, they actually need to actively agree to the medical intervention. In classical legal terms, these three elements are typically referred to as needing to exist in the context 
of the patient's capacity to consent and their consenting voluntarily or freely. A good example of informed consent in the context of healthcare can be seen in the decision of Castell versus de Grief of 1994 of the South African High Court. I will refer you as well to the book of Mason and O'Neill. It's a 2007 publication entitled Rethinking Informed Consent in Bioethics from Cambridge University Press. Um, and in this book, the idea of informed consent is quite neatly described as a communicative act, one where there is an exchange of ideas, um, where understanding can go wrong on both ends of the communicative process, um, and, and that really requires translation of concepts and understandings between two um, varied human beings. The Special Rapporteur on Health has explained that structural inequalities, such as power imbalances between doctors and patients, exacerbated by stigma and discrimination, results in individuals from certain groups being disproportionately vulnerable to having informed consent compromised. I think we need to understand that persons with disabilities suffer uniquely from structural inequalities in society and, and severe power imbalances between themselves and the healthcare providers that they confront. These exchanges do occur in, in contexts of significant stigma and discrimination around the individual's um, capacity, their, 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 the way in which they're conceived to understand or communicate, and in these ways, persons with disabilities are uniquely vulnerable to having their informed consent compromised. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities also recognizes that there is a very intimate link between forced medical interventions based on discrimination and the deprivation of a person's legal capacity as is so often experienced by persons with disabilities. Medical treatments, where they are of an intrusive and an irreversible nature, and where they lack a therapeutic purpose, may constitute torture or Ill, in, Ill treatment when they are enforced or administered without free and informed consent. The Special Rapporteur on Torture insists that this is irrespective again of any good intentions that might underlie those medical treatments. In this context, he makes specific mention of forced medication, including the forced psychiatric treatment of persons with mental disabilities, forced sterilization, and where these acts are purportedly done in the so-called best interests of the patient. So where a person with a mental disability is given forced psychiatric treatment against their informed consent, when these treatments are intrusive and irreversible, where they lack a therapeutic purpose, they may be torture, um, irrespective of how well intended they are. On psychiatric treatment, um, you are referred as well to the decision of the Human Rights Committee in Viana Acosta versus Uruguay, um, which further explains these, this relationship. I think this quote from the Special Rapporteur on Torture is quite important and I'll read it in full. And again, it really links back to the notion of a person with disabilities um, right to health being so delicately balanced on the recognition of their legal capacity and other foundational rights in the CRPD. The Special Rapporteur says that fully respecting each person's legal capacity is a first step in the prevention of torture and ill treatment. As already established by the mandate, medical treatment of an intrusive and irreversible nature where lacking a therapeutic purpose or when aimed at correcting or alleviating a disability may constitute torture or ill treatment when enforced or administered without the free and informed consent of the person concerned. <laughs> 
forced interventions, often wrongly justified by theories of incapacity and therapeutic necessity inconsistent with the CRPD, are legitimized under national laws and may enjoy wide public support as being in the alleged best interests of the person concerned. Nevertheless, to the extent that they inflict severe pain and suffering, they violate the absolute prohibition of torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. Concern for the autonomy and dignity of persons with disabilities leads me to urge revision of domestic legislation allowing for forced interventions. Forced or coercive sterilization and torture. The Special Rapporteur on Torture has particularly recognized how forced sterilization is an act of violence, a form of social control, and a violation of the right to be free from torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. It is not uncommon that persons with disabilities in some jurisdictions are forcibly sterilized. Um, it is quite clear from the Special Rapporteur's statement here that this is, by all means, a violation of the right to be free from torture and other cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. Because sterilization is forced, it violates informed consent and is therefore a violation of the right to health as well. A very interesting decision on coercive sterilization came out of the Namibian Supreme Court, but I'm citing here the High Court judgment's definition of what is required for valid consent to surgical sterilization. This case didn't deal with persons with disabilities, but with women living with HIV. Quite similarly, I think, to the thinking that underlies um, the sterilization of persons with disabilities, there was implicit in the narratives of the healthcare workers in, in, in the, this, the case of the three women concerned in, in the LM case in Namibia, that it was not in their best interests that these women continue to have children. Um, the healthcare workers uh, uh, solicited their agreement under quite coercive circumstances, and the court held that there, there was no valid informed consent to the sterilization and, and therefore the sterilization was unlawful. And I think what the High Court says here about what is required for consent to surgical sterilization should be quite equally applicable for persons with disabilities and um, understanding concepts of communication and voluntariness in the light of the CRPD. And here the court says that a decision to undergo surgical sterilization must be made with informed consent, and this is opposed to merely written consent. Informed consent implies an understanding and an appreciation of one's rights and the risks and consequences available um, and available alternatives to the patient. An individual must also be able to make a decision regarding sterilization freely and voluntarily. In the cases of these women, they were often seeking um, uh, antenatal care or, or con contraceptive care when they were seeking to access healthcare services when the notion of sterilization was proposed. And many, a lot of research shows that in those, those contexts, uh, patients often don't feel fully free to decline other services at the risk of being denied the healthcare treatment that they seek. And, and those kinds of practices need to be carefully considered in the context of persons with disabilities as well, whose access to sexual and reproductive health care services might in any case be quite constrained. Moving on to the use of restraints in healthcare. I think it is quite clear here that the Special Rapporteur has a very clear and unqualified view on the absolute ban on the use of all coercive and non-consensual measures, including restraint and solitary confinement 
on persons with psychological or intellectual disabilities. The Special Rapporteur states that this absolute ban should apply in all places of deprivation of liberty, including in psychiatric and in social care institutions. I think what is important here is that the, this, the Rapporteur stresses the environment of patient powerlessness and how an ab abusive treatment of persons with disabilities in which restraint and seclusion is used can lead to other non-consensual forms of treatment such as forced medication and electroshock therapies. The Special Rapporteur also speaks to, um, and in this context, the notion of medical necessity. He says that non-consensual detention, seclusion and restraints can only be legitimate to prevent serious harm to the patient or to others and with measures for the time strictly necessary to avoid such harm. The state has the burden to legislate and enforce this very narrow scope of non-consensual treatment. My question to you here, we understand that torture is an absolute prohibition that law recognizes no exceptions, no lawful justifications for the use of torture or inhuman and degrading treatment. Does this exception that the, the special rapporteur carves out for a very narrow scope of non-consensual treatment hold water if that conduct is nevertheless torturous, inhuman or degrading? Food for thought. Mm -hmm. involuntary admission and torture. The Special Rapporteur has further stated that the deprivation of liberty when based on the grounds of disability that inflict severe pain or suffering can amount to torture or to inhuman degrade and degrading treatment. Factors that the, the Rapporteur says here will be important to consider include the fear and anxiety that is produced by indefinite detention the infliction of forced medication or electroshock therapies, the use of restraints and seclusion, and the, the segregation of the person from their family and their community. These are all elements that should be taken into account in assessing whether a particular deprivation of liberty, when based on the grounds of disability, amounts to torture or inhuman and degrading treatment. The Special Rapporteur here criticizes some judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Firstly, he criticizes a judgment in which non-consensual treatment was justified on the basis that the patient was of, quote, an unsound mind. The Special Rapporteur says that this raises a discriminatory basis for treatment, which is impermissible, and therefore involuntary admission and non-consensual treatment cannot be justified on these grounds. He secondly criticizes justifications based on so-called medical necessity, and here he crit critiques the European Court of Human Rights decision in relation to Austria. I wanted to refer you here to an interesting decision of Wyatt versus Stickney from the United States. Uh, while an imperfect decision, I think it, it explains some important context to how multiple infringements of persons with disabilities in accessing healthcare, and particularly persons with mental disabilities, might compound violations. Um, here, the US District Court Judge Frank Johnson ruled in 1971 that thousands of patients who had been committed involuntarily unquestionably have a constitutional right to receive such individual treatment as will give each of them a realistic opportunity to be cured or to improve his or her mental condition. 
he noted that these patients had been involuntarily committed through non-criminal procedures and without the constitutional protections that are afforded defendants in criminal proceedings. He continued, adequate and effective treatment is constitutionally required because absent treatment, the hospital is transformed into a penitentiary where one would be indefinitely held um, for no convicted offence. Johnson proclaimed, to deprive any citizen of his or her liberty upon the altruistic theory that the confinement is for humane purposes, then fail to provide adequate treatment, violates the very fundamentals of due process. So in that case, in essence, the court is saying that if you involuntarily admit people and don't actually provide them the health care treatment, um, it's clear that the purpose is not for treatment. Um, we have since progressed under the CRPD beyond this point, where we find the notion of involuntary treatment abhorrent in itself, um, as sustaining other forms of, of involuntary treatment. Lastly, treatment denial and torture. The Special Rapporteur on Torture and, um, has stated in, with respect to palliative care that the denial of pain treatment um, usually exists in acts of omission rather than commission, and usually there is no intent to cause suffering. Um, it's typically due to uh, failures in, in the acquisition of drugs or procurement processes, that the denial of pain treatment occurs. Suffering from pain due to absence of train pain treatment infringes on the prohibition on torture and inhumane and degrading treatment nevertheless, if it meets the following conditions. Firstly, if that denial of treatment is severe and meets the minimum threshold under the prohibition of causing severe mental or physical suffering, and where the state is or should be aware of that suffering, including when no appropriate treatment was offered. And thirdly, when the government failed to take all reasonable steps to protect individuals' physical and mental integrity. I'm sure we could argue that similarly to palliative care, the failure to provide um, mental health care treatment at primary health care level um, similarly can amount to an infringement on the prohibition against torture and inhumane and degrading treatment if these three constituent elements are met. Uh, an example that you referred to here is the Osman case from the European Court of Human Rights and um, the, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights General Comment 14. Thank you very much for your time and um, I hope this was useful and that you'll refer to the resources here, especially the Special Rapporteur's report.